Live from Cambridge, Massachusetts, it's The Cube at the MIT Chief Data Officer and Information Quality Symposium. With hosts Dave Vellante, Jeff Kelly, and Paul Gillen. Okay, we're back for a wrap up. This is Dave Vellante with Jeff Kelly and Paul Gillen. We're here at the MIT Information Quality Symposium. It's been two days of uh, Kool-Aid injection on the, the chief data officer. Uh, it's, it's been great, guys. I mean, this is the second year we've, we've been here. Uh, I think MIT's done a great job of bringing together different constituencies to study the opportunities around data, data governance, data standards, information quality, and the emerging role of the, of the chief data officer. Uh, we heard from two CIOs this week that the CIO role could vaporize within the next 10 years. Uh, they were both within healthcare, so maybe it's unique to the healthcare field, but essentially we heard John Halamka uh, and as well uh, Jim Noga, who's with Partners, say that this, the CIO role is a, it's a lot of operational role, it's, it's like a COO role essentially. Uh, Halamka said, hey, I started coding, no CIOs are coding this year. That, that's a technical role. So the CTO role is really what, what Jim Noga said would emerge as the, the vector being COO um, and, and, and a CTO role with the C chief data officer also reporting into the, to the, the COO with responsibility for data governance. That was one of the most interesting comments that, that I heard. I mean, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. And, and I, think, I think it was also fascinating that we didn't detect any regret. Right. right. They didn't seem to be upset about this. They were saying, well, I don't have to worry about infrastructure nearly as much as I used to. I don't provision servers anymore. I don't stay up at, uh, at night worrying about downtime. I'm doing mostly governance and strategy right now, which I like better anyway. Uh, so so, uh, so, what if that, if that traditional role goes away? I didn't really like it to begin with. Uh, I don't, didn't get the sense that they thought that they weren't marketable, but that rather that the, the skills, maybe their job evolves into a COO type of position. Maybe these are the future COOs, or maybe they are the future CDOs, but they're getting they're getting rid of a lot of the the uh, uh, you know the the, junk, the scut work that CIOs have traditionally done. Well, Amazon calls it uh, non-differentiated heavy lifting, and I, I'm <laughs> I'm very strongly of the opinion that Amazon is going to be provisioning infrastructure better than anybody else in 10 years, mm -hmm. and you're seeing the uh, companies like Amazon generally, but specifically Amazon step up in, in compliance. We heard that today. We heard that a couple years ago, maybe not so much, but Amazon's really do, checking the boxes on compliance, doing the things that are making us comfortable. We heard from Halamka that, that Dropbox does, won't you know, take certain risks, but Box will. Uh, so you're seeing cloud providers realize if they want to get into the enterprise, they've got to adopt certain security policies. And, and again, specifically in the case of Amazon, you're seeing them uh, bring up more and more and more innovation that is being, becoming acceptable to more enterprises. Now there's still a big chunk of folks that will tell us, public cloud, no way. I won't do that. Particularly you hear that a lot in financial services, but surprisingly we didn't hear that in, in healthcare. And I'm very strongly of the belief that the marginal economics of, of the public cloud are going to be so compelling over the next 10 years as to, as to overwhelm the business case. And so, Absolutely, and you're seeing, you're seeing a price war going on in the public cloud right now, and it's only going to get worse, or w worse or better if you're the customer. <laughs> so why should you worry about, uh, about uh, uh, investing in hardware that you're going to have to depreciate and you're ultimately going to lose a lot of that money when you can pay a monthly fee and the prices will just keep going down. And so that leaves application development, uh, and certainly most organizations are, 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 have been moving to commercial off-the-shelf applications for, for years, maybe doing some customization. So where's the differentiation? It's data. It's data, it's the analytics and how you're using data. So, you know, I agree with this shift. I mean, I think the cloud is really pushing the shift for the role of the CIO. They're becoming much more um, kind of portfolio managers, managing uh, an array of services rather than um, provisioning infrastructure and making sure everything's connected and running well. Uh, but you're right, I agree completely. The, the differentiator is going to be increasingly how organizations uh, monetize their data assets, simple as that. Um, you know, but there's also the compliance and governance aspect of that as well. So you're really seeing the CDO role emerge with kind of a dual mandate, one on the governance uh, and compliance side, but also to their mandate is to um, help the organization better 
make use of that data, show them new ways they can ask, uh, leverage data as an asset. So um, it's both the governance compliance and the analytics and insights. So it's a pretty big role. So that's what I say. So where's the dissonance here? So we got a, so a lot of agreement, but where's the dissonance? It, it, we've got that, the, that wide scope that you just described. I mean, a lot of organizations are saying, well, it's the, it's the sort of individual business unit and their data scientists that are going to drive that value. They're really not going to have to rely on some central service organization from a CDO. What are your thoughts? No, on I that? would agree. I think the CDO role should focus more on uh, the governance issues um, and creating a foundation where and empowering business units and data scientists and analysts within business units to then take advantage of that data. So providing business units with clean, um, actionable data that they can then uh, leverage because it's the business units that know their particular business problems better than any centralized person. So, and, and Paul, we heard the guys from State Street talk about um, standards you know, and, and, and the promise of, of standards and then of course Bill Emman was rolling his eyes. And so, <laughs> so there were some points of disagreement this week. Well, I, I don't think Bill Emman was rolling his eyes at the idea of standards. He was rolling his idea at the idea of standards committees. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, standards and, and are think, great. And, and John yeah, Malamka, if you, yeah. his, his great quote at the end, he said, there, there are forest people and there are tree people. <laughs> standards, the standards committee people are bark people. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it, it can be very frustrating for people who think big, you know, to, to, to get bogged down in the standards. But standards themselves are, are a good thing. I think uh, most of these our, our speakers would agree. Now, David Saul, who is a very impressive mm. guest this morning, a very smart guy, uh, chief scientist at State Street, uh, talking about the importance of, of, of metadata and, uh, and, and having standardized ways that financial institutions can exchange data with each other and regulators can access that data and just streamlining the whole regulation process, making everything more transparent. It just makes sense. And it's good to hear, it's good to see smart people like, uh, like David Saul and, and uh, David Plaskowski, from, both from State Street, are, are working along these lines. You know, you asked about dissonance, Dave, and I, and I think the dissonance here is is internal to organizations, and uh, and the silos, and the data ownership, uh, and the, the 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 way organizations uh, tend to favor uh, individuals concentrating data and hoarding data and hiding it from their colleagues because data is the source of power. What CDOs are going to confront as they they move out, uh, as this role grows, is they're going to have to, to bust apart this mindset that says that it's my data because it's my, you know, that's what makes me valuable to the organization. Yeah, As we heard from several uh, interviewees this uh, last couple of days about the need to, for, for people out in the business units to start thinking more about the value of data to the overall organization and less about specifically to them and their, their unit or department. And you're, you're absolutely right. The, the inclination and the way things have been, the standard operating procedure for so many years has been, well, this is my data, this is my little project, I know it better than anyone else. And I, I personally can relate, you know, I've got spreadsheets and I've got data that, you know, we, we size markets and, you know, somebody wants to look at that and I say, well, what, what, what do you want to look at that for? What do you, what do you want to look at my data for? I, don't, I know I can interpret this best. So I completely can I relate to it. <laughs> so, you know, and that you is... You want to a, see the sausage. Right, that's a big, you know, that's a cultural shift and that, that, that gets down to, you know, you, that's like hand-to-hand -hand combat. You got to get down there and convince people and that is not an easy thing to do. Okay, so uh, we, what, do we, what do we see evolve this year? The, the chief data officer role, um, still confined within regulated industries primarily, mm -hmm. uh, but, but has momentum. Uh, I don't think there's any necessarily more significant definition around scope. If anything, it's widened. Um, but I also feel like there's momentum and, and a tailwind, certainly within, within regulated industries. And I think in general, there's a sentiment that there's a lot of promise in terms of bringing data standards to organizations and leveraging and data and the, and the chief data officer is somehow, some way going to be fundamental uh, to that. So, uh, a year from now, what do you guys expect? Is, is the chief data officer role going to seep into non-regulated industries? Is going to momentum continue within these regulated industries? What do you guys think? Well, I, I'm ancient, so I remember when the CIOs first came, uh, when that a concept of CIO first came out online, which was in the late 80s, mm -hmm. and, and we went through much the same process where it was sort of, well, is this real? Uh, this is this a new title? It's a new role? Is it going to last? Does it have uh, does it have legs? And then, you know, five years later, it was just it, it, everybody was doing it. I think we're, we're moving that way with the CDO title. Um, I was interested, just parenthetically, though this conference was originally called the Information Quality Conference. 
we had very little discussion about information quality <laughs> across <laughs> across two days here. However, Stu Madnick uh, came came in toward the end of the day today, and he had some very compelling points to make. I think about not taking data at face value and how we have to. Uh, the, the role of the CDO and, and the whole organization will be to question data. Is that good data? Is it valid? Is it actionable? Because it's so easy to make bad decisions based upon data that looks like it's good. Yeah, I, I think in one of the roles, one of the jobs of the CDO is going to not just do that themselves in their department, but to foster um, that mindset in people out in the business units. Um, and that's one of the, I mean, really the CDO is a teacher in many ways. They have to teach the rest of the organization how to start thinking about data. And one of the things you've got to think about is take a step back. When, you've got, when you're analyzing some data and you get the results that are just perfect to your hypothesis, then you've got to take a step. That's the time to step back and say, okay, am I missing something here? Is something, uh, you know, is it the, 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 am I biased in the way I'm looking at this? So that mindset of thinking about questioning your data, questioning the way you look at it, that's something the CDO has to educate the rest of the organization about. Well, lies, damn lies, and statistics. I mean, I, I don't know. Do you guys think that dynamic is, is going to change as a result of the, the big data initiative? I almost feel as though, you know, those that can become data savvy, independent of data quality. I mean, a lot of times data quality is, is, is secondary to, to the data itself. And, and we talked about this, Paul, sort of advancing a, a political agenda. And when I say political agenda, I mean within, within an organization, for example, or a public policy agenda. Um, is, is, is will will that change? Will that dynamic change as a result of no? Of, of, yeah. <laughs> I, you so, know, yeah, I, I'm I'm kind of a research geek, and yeah. and so when I read surveys, the first thing I do want to do is look at the methodology. How many people were surveyed? What were they asked? You know, how who, uh, when how were they surveyed? And so where's the often, bias? Yeah, <laughs> so bias. And so often you see research that 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 makes headlines in the news. And when you when you dig down into how the research is conducted, it's totally bogus. It's, it's biased. Right. It's it's just bad research. And there's more of that out there than ever now because it's so easy to conduct research. So the trend over the last few years has been that the quality of data is getting worse, uh, at least in terms of our our uh, um, the data is. We are applying fewer filters to data because we tend to, to sensationalize, we tend to be attracted to that which validates our point of view, kind of human nature. Yeah, data quality, I feel as though, you, you made the point that there wasn't a lot of talk about data quality. I feel like data quality in the aggregate is, it's Don Quixote chasing windmills. Um, I think in general, data quality has, has gone way down as a result of the amount of data that's in this, in the types of data, however, uh, for sp specific initiatives, data quality is, is critical. And I think that's really the big, the big takeaway here in, in terms of uh, uh, actually getting value out of data. You, you have to have some kind of data structure, data architecture, and data quality initiative. And we are seeing areas where that's changing. As, as John Halamka pointed out, mm -hmm. electronic health records have gone to 80% adoption right now. That's pretty high quality data for the most part, and that's going to improve the quality of healthcare. Mm -hmm. And you know, look, bottom line is for, for an enterprise, you can you, you know overlook data quality at your own peril. If you're if you're going to develop, because we, we hear from a lot of speakers today who are not necessarily data uh, chief data officers or data scientists themselves, but some of the academics who are focused on their research on really uh, ways to transform the enterprise. Talking about business transformation, these big big theories around transforming enterprises to take advantage of data. If you're going to transform your enterprise in a fundamental way on bad data, well, your enterprise isn't going to be around for a lot longer. So you're going to see some of these <laughs> companies and issues weed themselves out if you're basing it on bad data. But, I mean, the bottom line is you're going to see the results in the revenue and profits of these, these companies. So when Facebook you know, derives X amount of data from, X amount of revenue from their, uh, you know, their mobile advertising initiative, that's because of data that's using it in a way that's providing value. If it wasn't providing value, they wouldn't be driving that much revenue. So in the end, it'll take some time to shake out, but you're going to see really the companies that succeed are the ones that do it the right way. Absolutely, I, and I can go back again to Stuart Madnick. Uh, uh, he, he, he dodged the question of whether MIT would, would get into the data science business. In fact, he said they won't. That's not really their orientation. But he did say this is an engineering school. And what engineers do, engineers have to seek truth because engineers have to build things that work. And so what he was saying was, I think uh, you know, the future belongs to engineers because they are the ones who will figure out what's good data and, and what's bad. All right, final thoughts, gentlemen. 
Jeff Kelly, what, 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 you know, any takeaways or, or things that, that, that you saw at this conference that excited you? What, what do you, what, what do you, what do you well, take Well, I mean, away? just generally speaking, I think we saw this year over last year, I think we're seeing um, the role solidify a little bit, the chief data officer role. We, we heard a lot about some emerging best practices, maybe not you know, set in stone at this point, but things around communicating with the rest of the organization, getting executive buy-in, some other uh, kind of best practices. So that's encouraging to see those things starting to take shape. That means, to me, that means this role is really becoming a real thing. And as I mentioned a moment ago, you know, it's really being tied, the CDO role is being tied to really large strategic initiatives. So to me, this, this you know, that implies this is a strategic role. This is not a tactical role. This is not a keeping the lights on kind of role. This is not a, you know, kind of a side science project as we've heard a lot of big data projects described that way. Um, and both of those things are encouraging to me. Um, you know, as we see this kind of, not just the role develop, but the use of data in the enterprise and government organizations as well. So, you know, overall, I think we're moving in the right direction. It'll be really interesting next year to see if we've got, you know, a few more of our guests here on the Cube or maybe from other industries. Um, I suspect we may see some in more of the commercial facing industries, certainly yeah. co companies that have a consumer uh, facing business mm -hmm. um, are ones that are going to, I think, look to adopt the CDO uh, role. So looking forward to next year as well. Paul, yeah, final thoughts? The last two years, for the last two years, this conference has been heavy on, on uh, healthcare and financial practitioners. Next year, mm -hmm. I expect we're going to see more retail, maybe some manufacturing, transportation. Uh, I think we're going to see more success stories next year. I want to see more tangible examples of how big data is, is changing businesses. Yeah, for me, it was um, one of the keynotes, uh, Richard Watson, when he talked about you know, digitizing your assets and, and driving uh, uh, essentially ROI. Uh, return and capital. And I think that I came out of this with several ideas as to how to do that. I think about cube videos, I think about the metadata around the cube videos, I think about translation around cube videos, diffusing uh, overseas. I think about all the Twitter data that we've captured and, 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 and how to uh, enhance that data. Uh, those digital assets, uh, I think, are something that um, I know we as an organization are very excited about. So, so that was my big takeaway. I'm going to pl actually apply some of the things that, do something that I different. heard. So um, hopefully a year from now, I can, uh, I can share some of that with you. All right, gentlemen, thank you very much. It was a great event. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone in the audience, for, for watching and listening and, and tweeting. Uh, Mark Hopkins, you know, appreciate you coming in, and, and, and Andrew Lowe, you guys with the, with the, the, the scaled down crew here. You know, I knew you could do it, so appreciate that. And, um, and, and of course, Art Lindsay, you know, doing everything in the back end. A lot of the stuff that you see is because folks like Art actually make it happen. Kristen Nicole, the editorial staff, really appreciate it. Um, John Furrier, you know, giving us advice on different questions to ask, so thanks for that. We miss you. Love to see you in Boston this summer. Have some chowder. That's a wrap. Thanks, everybody. This is theCUBE. We're live from MIT. Check out uh, siliconangle.tv for all these videos. You'll have the playlist up there. Check out siliconangle.com. You'll see blogs. Check out wikibon.org. For all the research, uh, wikibon.org slash big data is a lot of Jeff Kelly stuff. It's all there, it's all free. Check it out. Thanks for watching everybody, we'll see you next time. Which will be, next time live broadcast will be in, um, in Boston again, in August at the Vertica user event, uh, in August. So check us out there and uh, until then, have a great day. <laughs>